Hello and welcome to the Stories of Northern Life by the Sault Ste. Marie Museum. Today we have a series of clips taken from interviews with the Italian community, recorded in 2001. The clips are the answers to the question, have you been discriminated against? These stories are mainly from people born here in Sault Ste. Marie, but parents immigrated to the West End from Italy while very few interviewed immigrated themselves. Nonetheless, both groups experienced discrimination during the long period of time Italians and other newcomers were not accepted in the community. You will hear, in this order, the voices of Art Golazzi, Carmen Provenzano, Ines Ferrugini, Eric Alexandrini, John Camaletti, John Marasco, and again, Carmen Provenzano. So let's get into it. Um, the community may have had, you know, we were fighting on the ball field uh, against other teams and on the ice rings. And they were much against and we were attacking. And of course, in those days, um, with the, with the name WAP was always the WAP saying, you know, there was different definitions of the WAP. There were well-dressed people, that you were Italian, that you were a lot of bad things were said. But you know, it's kind of funny, up until a couple of years ago, my cousin went to uh, Ellis Island in New York. It's relative now. And uh, he went through the whole culture and what happened when he came to the old country. And, uh, and what happened was that there was different lines had papers you could hear. You didn't have papers. They put you in another line and on it they put WOP without papers. And that's where the walk originated. But none of us at that time knew that. And I just knew that two only two years ago. Without papers, you know. And those lines were apparently something out of this world that uh, um, people even changed names. Um, because if they, you went in the line, your name was Viola, and they said, Viola, you kept quiet. You said, yeah, that's the name, and they wrote it out. Because if it, if it was an incorrect name, they put you to one side, you wouldn't go in into the country. That's happened to a lot of people. They where? They were telling me that um, they rejected one person, somebody else kept the code, they were the line name, and moved them. So, um, you know, that walk was uh, quite a name, it was It was, the dividing line was course. Yeah, and it was terrible. Terrible in the dance halls. I was younger than the people that frequented the, you know, the Columbia, and that was a big dance hall. But there was a big field on Queen Street. Uh, my cousins of the event, and they were all involved in it. My dad was born in 1920, and there's something that you guys wouldn't be too familiar with. But we actually had in those early times, people trying to start up a Ku Klux Klan here. We read about that. Oh, you read about that? In like 1926 or something? Yeah. My dad was born in 20, but he was born right in a time where people were wanting the Italians to go back, sort of, quote unquote, go back home. Mm -hmm. Home meaning Italy. Mm -hmm. Because they were looking at Italians as really second class citizens. And, um, they used to have this thing, probably the other people you talked to, Gore Street was a dividing line. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you, you didn't get you didn't go past Gore Street without risking it. And so Italians had a very tough time to find acceptance. One of the ways they coped was and you'll see it and this is what I've had uh, a real privilege in being an MP traveling across the country. No matter where you go, you see an Italian hall. You might see other things, but you see an Italian hall. Almost every city in this country, the places where people are getting married, is there's a, a hall that was built by the Italians. Mm -hmm. You see to yourself, why? What makes, what was, what made us different say, than, than the Irish or the, uh, and I can only guess because I didn't live at that time, but I think what it was is because these people came and the language
language and the customs and just everyday life required to be understood and required uh, like you just need you needed assistance you bought a house you needed to go to a lawyer uh, you bought insurance or you got something a letter a simple letter didn't know what it meant because you didn't read English. Um, I remember seeing an ad when I was, and, and I wish I would have kept it. But I'll just give you an idea of the way Italians were regarded in those days in, in the uh, in the thirties. This was an ad. Explosion at the blast furnace or something kills. And they gave the guy's name, so-and-so, it was an English name. Expl this is, the headline was Explosion Kills Three at Algoma. So you read, so-and-so resided in such and such a place here, was killed today, and two Italians. They didn't read to mention their name. They mentioned the guy's name. The Englishman and two Italians were killed. Like you might have says, this guy and two birds, yeah. or this guy and two two stray dogs were killed in an explosion. The Italians didn't count. They just they were statistics. And um, and that attitude was around for a long time. And there are still some people today that really can't come to grips with the notion. The people, somebody like me, even though my parents were born here, is somebody with my name is the is the member of parliament for Saint Marie. It doesn't sit well with them, but thankfully they're now in the minority because Italians have intermarried with everybody. Um, did you experience any forms of discrimination when you were younger? Oh yes. Very much. From the workers and oh yeah. The work. Well, you know, when I applied for my job, I shouldn't say it because <laughs> I think they're dead anyway. <laughs> but anyway, when I applied for my job, uh, you know, they put me in this place. It was the pink, pick, pickling tanks, pickling tanks, yeah. and I didn't like the job. It was dirty, you know. And I, uh, me as a woman, I didn't want. I was always fussy as to. Put so I used to put a bandana on my hair, mm. and we had to go to work with the pants and, and uh, the shirt thing. Mm -hmm. And all oh, these men passing by us, you know. I had to go hide myself in a corner. I was so shy. Aww. <laughs> and there was, there, was a, there was an office. There was an, a, a, an office there right, where I was working, not too far from where I was working. And I guess those men were watching me when I was working. It was me and... Um, um, and Connie Rainoni, she passed away, and uh, we both worked there. And uh, because my hair was fair, I was a blonde, mm -hmm. blue eyes and blonde hair. They never thought I was Italian. Oh, they never thought no, you were Italian. No, didn't know I was Italian. So they, uh, uh, two of them stopped there, and they said to me, "Looks like you don't like your job here." I said, "No, I don't like this job. I think my dad's gonna make me quit because I told my dad I don't like it." Mm -hmm. He says, oh, don't quit. He says, we're going to open up uh, the 44-inch mill. And he says, we've got an office there. You can work in the office, but you have to learn how to run the crane. Mm -hmm. And you're going to, we're going to teach you how to run the crane. And you'll run the crane there. You put the, the rolls on, on the lathe. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody down below that directs me. And uh, I said, gee, oh, that's okay. That'd be good. I says, appreciate that very much. I don't want to stay here. I says, so, you know what he says to me? He says, come and see me in my office the next day. I went in his office, and he says to me, don't tell anybody that you're Italian, because you could you, you could be taken for a Swede, and uh, don't say you're Italian, and uh, what else do you say? And he says, when you come out of the shop, he says, you come out with the two bosses, mm -hmm. so nobody will ask you, nobody will question you. They were really, really worried. She was Italian. They didn't like us then. Mm. And um, 
you know, I thought my friend shove it, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I wanted a good job back at work. What are you going to do? Mm-hmm. There was d- discrimination, I think. Oh, yeah. Because many people, and then that's why when the war time came, the, the, the young fellows from the Western Italians, they were called to go to serve, eh? Mm-hmm. And uh, they got a place someplace up at Lee's Bay. And, pe- and the, the, and the parents used to, and uh, relatives, relatives used to bring them food up there, right? Mm-hmm. But then they caught them at that time. They yeah. caught them, yeah. But that's what they had to do. They didn't want to go to war. You wonder why? We were dagos. Um, did you experience any forms of discrimination when you were younger by workers, bosses, or your, even your neighbors? You want to know the truth? Mm-hmm. Yes, lots. Lots of discrimination. Lots, yeah. We were discriminated against. They used to call us Wops, Dagos, and, you know, we could cross the North Street area. Mm-hmm. But we went to that another day. When do you find out? Like, when did that change? Remember how old you were? When you found things kind of started turning around? Uh, I'd say maybe in the 50s. Yeah. It's the 50s. Uh, I got on the fire department in 1959. I tried to get on the police department that couldn't get on there so in the 50s things started to change did you experience any other forms of discrimination such as from uh, uh, the people you worked with neighbors possibly a boss I would have to say no mm-hmm. uh, as I grew into my profession as I said in high school that self-esteem really developed. Then in my profession, uh, we had, you know, the value system of the Catholic schools mm-hmm. and and the church. And really, I can't say that I suffered any uh, discrimination as from high school on mm-hmm. because I believed in myself. You believed in yourself. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I felt that I was as good as that guy over there. Right. That's and that's what you guys have to feel, you know, exactly. as doctors. Never feel that you're second class or what have you. Because I know my parents went through that. Mm-hmm. Especially my dad who couldn't read or write English. Oh, okay? yeah. And he was in the smelter. And he had some bosses mm-hmm. that were very, very tough on him. Mm-hmm. That were very, very tough on him. And I think going back to when I think of the Inco days, you know, there were some people in positions of authority that took advantage of the immigrant, whether he was Italian or Polish or Finnish, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and Ukrainian, because that was Congress. We had our Middle East League, mm-hmm. we had Finland Street, we had the place where Ukrainians were, the place where the Finnish people were living, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, like even now, when you look at, for example, the West End beyond Core Street, Okay, we used to have tracks, mm-hmm. you could track. Boy, you never, way back then, you know, to go beyond those borders, you were asking for trouble. Whereas now, there is that integration is the word I'm mm-hmm. looking for. And I think it's great. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I get carried away. <laughs> oh, no. oh, that's okay. We love this thing. <laughs> Did you go to elementary school? I went to St. Mary's School. St. Mary's? Yeah. Separate school. St. Mary's building is still there. Uh-huh. And how were you treated at elementary school or high school by the teachers and students as an Italian? How, like, well, I'd, I'd rather not say. I mean, uh, I, I, I was okay because I was in sports and I was involved in everything. But we, we used to have that, you know, that real antagonism towards the Italians at one time was real bad. And I remember going with a couple of girls and they used to tell me if my father knew I was with you, he would really get mad because they didn't want us to, to associate with them at that time. Eh? It was, we were West Enders and that was it. We were Italians were, were in the forefront in all the sporting events. We were always in the forefront. And 
and naturally the East End didn't like it very much. A lot of them, a lot of them, but actually I want to say a lot of them hated it. And like I told you, hey, the girl used to tell me, if my father knew I was out with you, he, he tanned my height. There's no way we'd go with Italians. That, that's, that's the way it was in them days. West of Gore Street, boy, we, we couldn't go to that other end. I could tell you lots of incidents, but you know, I, I, there's no place for it. But I guess the the mentality was that you couldn't pass Gore Street. Well, that's more or less. Uh, pass Gore Street was taboo for us. See? Every time we went to a dance downtown, it ended up in a big fight. There's always a fight. Somebody say, "Oh, you black rock," then that way, then the way we go. <laughs> Personally, I didn't participate. In it. Like I said, I got along with them because I, I played basketball, everything. If you could have changed anything about the Italian culture, what would it have been? You know what? If you'd asked me that question when I was in my twenties, I'd have given you one answer. In my forties. I'd have given you a different answer, and now I'll give you still a different answer. Because you know now, I don't think I'd change a thing. But in my 20s, I probably would give you a long list. Because I don't think I appreciated, and I don't think a lot of us appreciated who we were and where we came from and how proud, how justly proud we were to have the connection to Italy. I, I didn't want a connection to Italy. I didn't want one, you know? I'll be honest with you, when I was a kid, I didn't want a connection to Italy. I just wanted to be Canadian. And I still, I'm Canadian. My parents are Canadian. But I didn't even want to be bothered to, to think about what value my heritage was to me. And now, I, I treasure that heritage. We have the right to be so proud because we can share in that in, in everything that was Italian. And, you know, we come from a race of people that is amazing in the arts. You know, art, sculpture, music and those are things to me that express the human spirit and I think that, that Italians have found magnificent ways to express the human spirit I hope you enjoyed these true stories of discrimination in Sault Ste. Marie towards the newcomers to the Sioux from the early 1900s onwards. I also hope you can take these stories and reflect on today's world and how we can do our part in being kind and supportive to today's newcomers to the Sioux and beyond. Nobody should be treated differently based on their heritage or where they came from. Stay tuned for more episodes like this in the near future. And if you're interested in sharing your story on discrimination of any kind or as a newcomer to the Sioux, please reach out to us on our socials or email collections at siouxmuseum.ca. C-O-L-L-E-C-T-I-O-N-S at siouxmuseum, S-A-U-L-T-M-U-S-E-U-M dot C-A. Thank you so much for listening to the stories of Northern Life by the Sioux St. Marie Museum. I'm Mari, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.